good morning everybody and welcome to uh, the security stream of the GSE UK conference 2021. It's a pleasure to have you again. It, it feels really strange because it feels like just like yesterday we were uh, doing the GSE conference in 2020. So time goes very, very quickly indeed. So I hope you're all well and um, uh, I hope you're ready for uh, an exciting few days on the security stream where we've got 22 sessions, by the way, folks, just for the security stream alone. That's, you know, um, in, in, in addition to all the other streams that are running and all the sessions that are there, there's well over 200 sessions running. Um, so if you're going to stick with the security stream, that's like 22 CP points for those of you that need to acquire them. Um, and of course, the caveat there is that you need to complete your feedback. So for the purpose of, uh, of feedback. This is session 1AA um, and it gives me absolute pleasure to introduce Henry who was, I think you were with us last year weren't you Henry for the GSC Hi. conference? You did a session? Sure, yeah. Yes you did yeah so there's no escape now once you do one session then that's it you're signed up for life. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know if some of you saw LinkedIn yesterday but um, Herb Daly uh, posted uh, a comment about this session and he's already seen a preview so I'm sorry Henry but he set the bar really really high with uh, his, his comments there and uh, so very much looking forward to this and um, Henry tells me this morning this is going to be a little bit interactive so what we're going to do is um, shortly unmute your line so that that gives you the option um, to participate with what Henry is going to ask everybody to do. So I really do hope that you can uh, you can participate in that. Um, don't forget to post any questions that you've got in the chat. That's available. And uh, Henry said he's happy to take questions. Right, he can also see the questions um, as as well, and uh, we'll be happy to take those. Right. So please please do uh, take the opportunity to uh, do that. So Henry, it, the stage is yours, sir. Welcome back. Yes. Thank you very much. Well, first of all, in case you're listening or watching, Herb, I did not see the LinkedIn post, so um, I'm hope I'm uh, at least picking up some of the the bar that you've set there. Um, yeah, as Jamie said, this is session one AA. You can find the QR code for the review at the top left. That is not a proof of vaccination QR code. Don't mix it up, please. Um, yeah, these are. Um, um, the charity raffles for GSE UK this year. I think you will see them in all the presentations you'll be following um, these weeks, so I'll quickly skip through. Um, there's some other AAs sessions going on as well. Um, so in case you're accidentally in the wrong session, um, yeah, feel free to quickly run to the other one now, but um, I'd rather you stay because I hope we're going to have some, some fun and learn some things here. Um, I'm kind of proud and also a bit scared to be kicking off this security track. A um, bit, bit, bit weirdy. If it was a real conference, it would have been a bit too early for me too. But, um, oh, why is that not going? Yeah. Like Jamie said, there's a lot of other things going on in the security track. Um, warning on the fuzzing and debugging session by Jake. Sorry, Jake. Don't go there, he will scare you, but no jokes, do go there. It's gonna be amazing. Um, and then there is 244 sessions in total running. Um, so there's plenty of much to, to see and do these two weeks. Uh, my pro tip to all you is, sorry, Jamie, but don't stick only in the security check, have a look in some other track presentations as well, because usually, um, like the right picture says, out of your comfort zone is where the magic usually happens. Well, for those of you who don't know me, quick intro on me. Um, I founded Z DevOps, an IBM champion. I dabble a bit with um, Ziggy. Um, I love old computers and new computers. That's why the Commodore 64 is there. The cartoon in the middle is kind of my, um, well, general statement on things mainframe. And I'm also part of the GEC Europe and then the Dutch region. Um, if you want my details, you can find them later in the slides. No need to, you know, copy these. Um, so now there's no turning back. Let's get this, this show on the road. I hope we're going to make it in time because um, I do have 11, 12 things to cover. Um, it was planned as a live session. Unfortunately, we have to um, make do with a virtual one. 
but your participation is still requested, required, and definitely much appreciated. So I believe the organization has given you the option to unmute. So press that unmute button if you want to slash need to speak up. Um, and then we're going to play some Rock F Jeopardy. Why a Jeopardy format? Normally, you know, I would give a presentation and it will be like a like a one way stream of, of information from me to you guys and questions at the end. And I thought with a bit of, a, you know, a, a little bit of a look towards the Watson Jeopardy as well. Um, I'm going to give you the answers. You just have to think of the questions. Um, so the main question is who will start? And then we can play some, some Jeopardy. For those of you who don't know how Jeopardy works, um, there's like four categories with points. We're not doing the points this time because that would have been fun if it was um, a real you know, live presentation. Um, we'll go to the example so you get the answer. And then somebody either has to, I don't know, hold their hand up so Jamie and his, and his colleagues can unmute you or you unmute yourself and you just shout out the answer. And then if the answer is right, well, you would have gotten some points, right? Um, so any takers on this one, just for the practice? If not, right, you're supposed to answer, what is Whittlebury Hall? And, um, well, that will then bring us to the next, next subject. So my question to, um, to you, dear attendees, is any takers? And if not, I'm hoping Jamie will um, will pick one up. Or you can say it in the chat. I can read that too. Yep. Post your answers in the chat, folks. Um, well, come on, Jamie. Pick one. Uh, uh, coding 200. <laughs> coding for 200. That should be an easy one for most of you. Right now, of course, my screen here is going dead, so I can't see the chat anymore. Right, so an, a utility to unload RACF in a parsable format. And then, of course, I don't know, Jim is going to shout out the answer. Maybe not. Come on, Jim. <laughs> you can do it. <laughs> it is early, right? We'll, we'll, we've, got, we've got 11 more to go after this. It's okay. Um, so the question would have been, what is IRRDBU00, right? Um, it's a little piece of a, a program that you run like this, and it will unload your RACF database um, into a quote unquote parsable um, output that looks like this. This is just a little part of it, and it's, it's a layout. You know, it starts with a record type and then all kinds of fields, and IBM has lovely documentation on what part of the record means what, like the record layout. Um, of course, you can do that with DF sort. You can parse that with your own programs. But um, when I parse that output, I use quote unquote my own offsets.json, which is a very large JSON file that has every single record type um, for the RACF unload in it. And here's a little example of how you can then parse that file with Python and start making some, I don't know, reports, queries, um, and other stuff you might want to extract from your RACF database that might not go as handy with other tools. So on the left, you see um, the actual code that generated the output on the right with a couple of, uh, I don't know, like dots in between to make it a bit shorter. Um, but here you then see all the data set field, uh, the data set records with the universal X's and their owner, which in the COBOL code you can see are just actually all the real, uh, yeah, I don't know, field names from, from the record descriptions. So once you have that parsed, you can basically do anything Carla can do um, if you're a Z Secure shop. Um, and you can do it from the comfort of Python. You can then easily generate HTML reports, PDF reports. It's, it's really, really handy. Um, and you can also go hunt for orphans. We might have more on that later. Um, you can generate resource maps, who owns what resource, um, what, um, you know, what groups have access to what resources. It's, it's really handy for some report generation. 
Um, that offsets.json is still a bit private repo on GitHub. I might open it soon, but I'm always worried that, you know, it breaks for someone else and then they're going to ask me to fix it. But I, I might just open this one up. So that was coding for 200. Now, I hope everyone's a bit awake. Maybe um, somebody wants to pick another one. And otherwise, we're going to have to ask Jamie again. And Jamie's scoring all the points, right? You can unmute your line, folks, if you want to, someone wants to shout out the answer, or you can put it in the chat. Come on, Jamie, pick one, because otherwise we'll never okay. finish on time. Config 300. <laughs> oh, you're going for the hard ones. A RACF segment for specifying default SMS constructs during allocation. Nobody. Everybody's still sleeping. They would have been so much better in a real conference room, Jamie. Yes. The answer, obviously, is what is a DFP segment? I hope that rings a bell to anyone. Um, and then the question is, why would you want to use this? Um, it was brought to my attention by a buddy of mine. I think he is in the session as well. If not, he'll hear it on the recording, Louis. Um, very cool for mentioning this and then discovering this, discovering this. Um, it, it allows you to enforce allocation attributes through RACF, right? So there's no more, um, no more need to make very complex ACS routines for your storage managers. And um, they don't need to change routines when there's new high level qualifiers that need to be directed to certain storage groups or storage classes. Um, at the ZPDT setup um, over at Z DevOps, this is how we specify it. Um, so there's only you know, one rule. If the storage class is SCZDO, then that's also going to be the storage group. Um, then we have a group defined, just a RACF group that has a, um, that has a DFP segment that states the storage class, as you can see below. And then I hope this is, yeah, this is pretty readable. Um, Right on your data set definitions in, in RACF, again, you specify a resource owner, and that resource owner is now this DFP ZDO group, so that all allocations that are made to this um, data set profile that matches this RACF definition, they will get the DFP ZDO resource owner, which results into the SC ZDO storage class, and that resolves to the correct storage group. Um, and you can also control that on a per user basis, obviously. You don't have to do it on the data set level. You can also, um, you know, say if, if Jamie creates a data set, it's going this way. And if Henry creates a data set, well, it's going to go that way. All right. That's two done. People getting, getting a bit of uh, comfort to, to shout one. And otherwise, we're just going to ask Jamie again. Bits and pieces 100. Bits and pieces 100. Here it goes. The University of Georgia. Well, the answer is easy, but what's the question? We needed this clock sound going tick tock, tick tock. The answer is who runs the Rock FL mailing list? I hope we all know what that is. For the people who don't, look back at the slides for the how-tos. But it's just this humongous mailing list of people talking RACF stuff. As you can see here, this is, I think, yesterday or the day before's um, copy. Uh, you send an Gee, email. I, I oh, thought sorry. the answer was. I thought the answer was home of Ugga the bulldog. <laughs> In, an, in a non rakef Jeopardy setting, that would be the right <laughs> question, too. Yes, thank you. <laughs> well, I am coming to you less than 10 minutes away from the campus, so. Oh, wow. Cool. So I, I don't think RACF. I think UGA. <laughs> cool. Um, right, so you send the email to listserv at listservuga.edu. Um, make sure the body of your email says subscribe Raquel L, first name, last name, and then your, um, I think you need to be vetted for this list. I'm not really sure. 
I do know you can get booted from it, um, but then um, if you want to discuss or talk about some RACF related stuff, ask some questions, all you do is uh, send an email to that address and, uh, you know, the people from the mailing list will either ignore you, which they hardly ever do, or, you know, get you on the right track. Of course, this is another nice little hint towards other subjects in this Jeopardy. Right on. Well, the lady from Georgia, maybe. And if not, please shout out. Oh, I'm, I'm here. I'm not awake. Oh, um, that's okay. It, it's very early here. I can imagine. Oh. How about config for 100? That's a quite nice start. Here we go. Non-existent entries on access lists. Oh. No. IRR read zero, 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 one. Nah, close-ish. It was part of that little, what was it, config for two or three hundred. Um, what is an orphan? Yes, very oh. good. They are orphans. I don't know who that was, but a hundred points for you, dear sir. Um, so yeah, what are orphans? And why would you care, right? If you have non-existing profiles on an access list, you, that might not be nice if that profile gets recreated, um, you know, when you have like intern users or lab setups or an STC name that you're reusing, then this new user will, will still have all the access the old user had. And well, from a personal point of view, it's just unclean, right? It, it clogs up your RACF with unneeded stuff. So how can you find those things? Um, I do believe Set Secure has some reports on them. Um, I definitely know that um, the ICE Direct product by New Era will report on these. I'm not quite sure if that is in the um, the latest release um, yet. Um, I know that I've seen it. I'm not really sure if the New Era guys will be pleased with me saying this, but it's definitely is or gonna be in there. Um, so if you have that product, check out the, the updates on that. Um, you can go hunting for them yourself using those IRDBU00 unloads um, through Python, or you can parse those unloads with, you know, Iceman or COBOL, whatever, right? Um, I did some hunting myself as well on the um, the ADCD setup, the 2.4, that was, I think, or the 2.3, but we'll see. Um, and that found a lot of, well, not even, these are orphans as well, it's not... Um, a profile on an access list, but actually data set definitions for um, non-existing files anymore. That's how you delete those. And then there was a lot of like users on access lists um, that were no longer present on the system. John WD, um, Richard Gonzalez, I think, um, and a whole lot of other things. So of course I thought, mm, that doesn't look really tidy. So I discovered Twitter is the new reporting tool to IBM. I tweeted out that they had some, uh, you know, some remnants in the distribution. And within long, um, IBM Z replies, Zep replies, and um, you can find the tweets here, obviously. Um, and Zep said, well, we'll clean this up. And if you have anything else, please let us know. Um, I can confirm that the new ADCD release is indeed nice and clean, so I think job well done. Can we go on? Yes. Ooh. Oh, we're doing pretty good on time, people. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight left to go. I see Christian going blue, red for 200. I missed the first one, Christian, sorry. Uh, blue red for 200. A technique used to increase the difficulty of a buffer, buffer overflow attack. You got the, the question for that one, Christian, maybe. 
I know Jake does. <laughs> Everybody's still waking up. Okay, I think one of the cool settings we have on ZOS for a while now, I think. What is address space layout randomization? I do believe I have some demos running now and I hope they work. I didn't sacrifice my goats to the demo gods yet, but I did make a recording, so it should be okay. Um, but what does it do? It, it ups your defenses against buffer overflows, like all this scary stuff you'll be hearing this week um, that Jake is going to talk about. Um, when you enable ASLR, it, it, it'll make a random address space layout every time. So a, like a calculated buffer overflow attack is somewhat, if not a lot harder to, to, to perform then. Um, be aware if you're going to apply this at your shop, um, it does have some impact on available private storage. Um, this is just from the, from the IBM pages, but you lose 63 pages for your 24 bit and 255 for your 31 bits. Um, again, if this was a real conference, I'd probably have a talk with Mark over some beverages later this evening. And I wanted to know the itty bitties of this. Um, maybe that'll happen some other time. Of course, it's not that big an issue. Um, IBM states if you increase your CSA by, by 1M for both those things, um, that should more than account for the, the loss you get by enabling ASLR. Then if you're really serious about some address spaces not having this due to that private area um, worry and or requirements, um, you can prevent those address spaces from, I don't know, for a better word, ASLR by using the exempt uh, profile or resource in the facility class. And then you just add those job names to it. Um, and there's the link. Oh, oh yeah, the demos on the other one. Oh, we are doing okay on time. Right on. Anybody else who's starting to wake up? Or otherwise- This we'll is 200. Bits and pieces, 200, you sure? Yeah. Boom. Ah, um, the title was 11 Rock F things, right? And four by three, I can only get, uh, I get 12 questions. So I had to put in one bomb um, <laughs> and you lose half your points. Sorry. <laughs> no, we're just, <laughs> that was the, the quote unquote filler spot. But a good pick, thank you very much. Oh, opening the chat here. Jamie, you want to shout one out? Oh, Who's go on then. Uh, blue red three hundred. Oh dear. This is um, this is the the um, the cherry on the whole cake, to be honest. But um, it's a program in just two dot four checked September 16 for the latest time um, that is vulnerable to a buffer overflow attack. No, I'm very happy nobody knows this, right? It is C-Sample. It's a sample module that's part of, um, part of your installation. You can check that out. But basically, um, again, do go to Jake and follow him, get a very large input, see that it buffer overflows, do some calculations, create a better input, run it again, profit, right? Unless they got ACE check enabled and um, you won't be able to do that much damage. So here's a little nice little demo that I hope will run. We're running this thing with the large input. It abends and the program is still half runs, but then it depends on the input. And you can see that we have a very bad register 13 filled with A0 bad 013 and a register 15 that's stored with that. Just saving that address for, for proof that it's always the same. And then when you run it again, 
there it comes. All right, you, you get the same, uh, the same these addresses. Oh, this recording messed up. This is ASLR active, so you see the difference. Um, right. Oh, my redacted is still there. That's good. Right, so basically that, that A bad 13 is somewhere 5 billion lines across your input. And um, that allows you to do that thing. If you enable the ASLR, just this to quickly show you how to do that through the DIAC member, you just say yes. And then um, we're enabling this now. Let's wait for this to run. You get the messages that you know the new DIAC member has been is in effect. Then it starts again. And then if we run it, you will see what you saw before. Um, because I misrecorded this. As you can see. But then you constantly see those those address the positions in memory are, are constantly changing, so that totally makes it very hard to, to construct you know a proper exploit on this. Put it that way. So the pro tip is maybe you should enable ASLR on your system if you haven't done so already. Um, let's see, Jamie. Coding 100. Let's start it off easy. Huh? <laughs> a well-maintained, open-sourced ISPF RockF admin tool. There must be somebody here who knows what that is. Oh, what is Ziggy? No, unfortunately, Christian, Ziggy is, is for Git. Unfortunately or luckily, it doesn't do RockF. No worries. It is. Rakev Adam, uh, you can find the link at the bottom. Um, of course, available at um, at Sam's brilliant CBT tape environment. It's file 417. You can download it, bring it to your mainframe, and provided you have enough authorization on your system, you can then um, work with the um, the Rakev environment in a somewhat easier way than the default RACF panels. I think it's mainly interesting for the, the people running, you know, their local um, ZPDTs or ZDNTs as like the RACF panels are not that user friendly, no offense to IBM. Um, so yeah, there's like a gazillion options there um, to manage your, your RACF environment, set, create users, create groups, um, all that stuff. And it also just for a quick view, then that's one of the nicely maintained bits. Um, it creates reports that are defined and added to this, this product, like I would say nearly constantly. Um, this is just a little overview. As you can see, there's 70 reports in the version I have, and I know I'm not running the latest version of Rakiv Adam. So there's probably more in there now, but it, it, it really helps you create some cool cool and nice reports and those are definitely handy in your um, in your shop as well so not to be using it for um, you know management of Rakev but the reporting bit is is definitely uh, definitely nice I, I did not know that existed Henry is it how often is it updated then um, I oh Mitch, I'm messing this up um, I haven't got a clue because um, you know I've, I know there's a lot of updates going on to this and um, I also know that Sam doesn't cut, cut a CBT type um, like every single day, but yeah, make sure if you want the latest and greatest head over to CBT tape and, and check the updates. Cause even though the, the actual tape, even though it's not tapes anymore, will not be created that uh, Sam will always put out this, this update thing. And then they're not in the, I would say the final stage in the final place of things, but you can get the, the latest. Um, there is some versions lingering around on GitHub as well. Um, 
but I think the the um, how would I put this the most current and real you know official official if you can say it that way version is um, is gettable through um, CBT tape, where of course you can find a truckload of other cool stuff as well. Good okay, question. Great. Good question. Oh, we are definitely doing good on time. Shall we finish the coding bit? Just go for coding 300. Go for it. Definitely. Um, you wouldn't know this one, I think. Um, a Python module for executing a rack route verify, AKA testing a log on. Pi route. Um, another dabbling, uh, and <laughs> dabbling of mine that I'm basically bringing here to shout out for help because I can't get it running perfectly. Um, but seeing as Python is becoming bigger and bigger on, on, on the Z platform, um, eventually with, you know, the possibility of running Flask and creating web applications or, or APIs um, running in Python, you, you want to, to me, at least I thought you want a nice and easy way to, to do user authentication. Of course, Python natively hasn't got a clue about um, about Rakef. Um, so I've got a little PyRoute environment on um, on GitHub. You can clone it or download it and bring it to your mainframe, and run the you know the standard Python setup.py install um, for the mainframe environment ZOS USS. You need to specify the C compiler. Uh, to be C99, because I think that, well, the default in Python is, is a bit different um, in the regular setup installer. Um, yes, Bill, and check the code before you run, definitely. Um, it's not like my Ziggy installer or Git installer that will give you the big warning when you don't, but yeah, thanks, thanks, Bill. Um, there is some typo additional ZOS quirks which I've all mentioned in the, in the GitHub repo readme file. Um, one of them is that obviously if you wanna do the underscore pass WD, you know, rack root function, you can't just do that. Your, your program needs to be program controlled. And that needs to be true for the entire um, call chain, right? So not even, it's not just your compiled pyroute.so file that needs to be program controlled, but also Python itself. Um, I haven't really got into the, the itty bitty details of how problematic slash scary that would be, um, or if there's there's like security issues by doing so, but um, the result is that it works and that was the goal for this. Um, the entire setup.py easy installer by Python on ZOS does not work as expected. Um, also, it, it tries to run this LXC echo command, which doesn't work, and it gives you all these kind of nasty errors. But if you follow the steps on the GitHub repo, um, yeah, which is here, um, you also see the usage on, on how you should run this, right? So you can import the module and then just verify a user password combination. Um, I think, yeah, this is a bit of the, um, well, the main code of the plugin, there's a lot of boiler plating for, you know, the Python interfacing to see, but um, as you see, it's, it's the, the core of the code is just that underscore underscore pass WD function that will either return false um, or true, depending on, on, you know, if it's correct or not. Here's a little screenshot of how it runs once you have it properly compiled and, and installed. Um, of course, I um, redacted my sys1 password for IBM user, um, but you can run the verify user with the good pass that will yield true, and with the bad password, it will yield false. That will enable you to, to do some user authentication natively to RACF on Z without going through, I don't know, Tiffany directory server, LDAP interfaces, or, or all that stuff. I still need to fix it for passphrases, I think, but I'm not sure. Um, the installer needs to be a more user-friendly. And yeah, again, the, my shout out to help to 
all the dear people here on this call, if you think, oh, I can fix some stuff there, please do, right? Um, that's what we put everything on GitHub for. So we've got the coding done. We've got blue, red nearly done. Configs one left. Oh, we're definitely doing good. Jamie, pick well, one. Christian's already done it. So he said config oh, 200. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right, we'll finish the config. Sorry, I wasn't paying attention to the chat again. Here, yeah. well, remember that, um, uh, you know, them buffer overflows uh, that could potentially modify the uh, accessor control uh, environment element or something, the ACEE. So how would you configure your system to be aware of stuff happening there? At least one person should know this. And hopefully at the end, all of you will remember this and check at your shop if you do. Pete Buckley, ACEE check. Yes, my friend, points to you. ACEE check. Um, why would you want this active? Well, as stated, um, you know, this is again a copy paste from the IBM documentation, but if a user increases his authority, um, make sure that it still complies with your policy, right? You might have some programs that are validly flipping their ACEE bits to do some stuff. Um, I think HSM is known to do something like that, especially through some user exits sometimes, um, but, but it will alert you. Um, so when these guys do their thing, right, these, these evil hackery kids trying to break your system, you, you can detect on, on, on them doing so, and you can even stop them, sort of. So you enable it through setrops class act ACE checked. Obviously, you need to rock list it too, or you'll get this uh, 1404i message um, so that it's active and working. And from that moment onwards, after the refresh, anytime an ACEE gets flipped, you will get a warning in the job log and the syslog. Like stated, you might have programs that are doing this as part of their functionality. You want them to do this. So you can exclude those from, um, from the warning messages that you receive in the system log and in the job log. That's a program name. And then that chain of execution um, for like who's running it and who's, you know, who's allowed to be doing so. Of course, when you um, enable these um, exclude classes for certain programs, Please define those in the program class too, so people can't take your excluded program name and use that as their own program name right, to, to make it full end-to-end -end secure. Um, then there's an extra message you should take. Um, I think you should, IBM states this in the manuals too, um, you should set up auditing on that, um, on that class so you, know, you can see and know and report on when programs get added to the exclude list because then you won't see the warnings anymore um, and you can also find, define the IRR event on failure profile in the ACEE check class and that will enforce a S4C6 event with the code of 2766 as a reason code. Um, I think that's funny for two reasons. One, 2766 is ACE in hex. Um, but also it only, as far as I've seen, events the next step or the next, probably it's the next TCB. If Mark was here, he would probably be, be able to tell us more about this, but it, it will only break the next step once you've you know, flipped the bits and start doing your wanted and or bad stuff. So um, if you take a look at this, this little job here, um, we're running a simple um, IKJEFT listing the IBM user, then we're doing something bad, and then we're listing the IBM user again, right? Nothing too magical. I hope the colors are right. I think they are. So in this, this first step, right, the, the check it step, we, we get the warning that we're not authorized to list IBM user because we ran this job with just a low, I don't know, a low level, low authorized user. Then 
you know, in the middle, we run this, this nasty step, flipping ACE bits. And then afterwards, we, we see that the LU IBM user command just, just works, right? Um, this is not a happy situation um, from a systems programmer's point of view. Um, and if we, you know, again, look at the job output, it, of course, it all crashes and we get all these funky registers breaking and stuff, but you know, there's no indication that, that something nefarious has happened. Now, if you enable that ACE check profile, you will get this, um, well, this message during the, the executing step or the executing program that, um, sorry, get the chat back up, um, that has done this ACE flip, you get a notion, you get the, um, the user, you get the job name, and you know, either that will give you a reason to go and find this setdeo HK user and start slapping him or bringing that, um, that job and or program into your exclude list because you really want this to happen. I hope this example states that this example is something you wouldn't want to happen, right? Um, but then if we run that third step, and that's after the warning, um, it still works. Right? I still get this nice output for the IBM user stating that I'm now, you know, I'm at least uh, um, auditor and or special and or operations um, through that, that flipping of the bits. Now, if we enable this IRR event on failure, you can see that that last step will totally crash um, because your command envelope breaks. I think it's a very nice deceptive message, but here we see that event 4C6OACE, um, which then proves that this actually works. Um, but the bad step is not abandoned after the flip. It's, it's only like the next, um, um, the next task, the next step that will run. So you could still do bad things there. Um, another reason to get this um, address space layout randomization up and running. Cool. Should I just pick blue and red for 100 to finish that one? Let's Go see. for it. Because <laughs> we all know this now there, because you know the idea was you follow it top to bottom. So a flaw in software usually written in a memory unsafe programming language such as C. One, two, three. What is a buffer overflow vulnerability? Right, um, just to reiterate what we've already seen in the previous, but in the flow, <laughs> next, um, next question slash answers. Right, yeah, there's a program that is badly programmed. Um, you give it too much input data, it overflows into you know, overflowed storage, controlled storage that you should not be writing to. And if you can, if you're a smart cookie, then you can use that to your advantage to make that program do other things than it was intended to do. Um, I stole this picture from Chad's Black Hat 2018 slides. Thank you, Chad. Uh, the link is there if you want to see the old presentation on this from 2018. And again, um, please join Jake in his session for, um, for more, more information, I think. which leaves us with the last one, bits and pieces for 300. And also I have forgotten what, oh yes, this is a nice one. This is a nice one, a plus and a minus sign. That is the answer. And what would be the question? Let's see. I think Bill should probably know this, right? No, Bill, we'll go. What characters can't I use in my password when I said password pre-prompt on? I hope you all have password pre-prompt on, but then again, you probably don't have it yet because you would have known this because a lot of users bump into this. Just a quick recap, password pre-prompt um, changes this TSO logon mode where just giving a user ID will already tell you if the user ID is a TSO user or not, right? enabling you to enumerate users on a system just by you know, typing all the 
permutations of the letters, eight characters, two characters, well, I think you get the drift. And if you enable this um, password pre-prompt in IKEA TSO00, I think, um, then you need to enter your um, password before you can um, go in. You know, before you before you get the message, sorry, user ID password combination not valid. Um, the downside is, let's just go back here. If 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 you have the, um, your password ending in a plus or a minus, it will be seen as I think an ISPF continuation character, and then the, your logon will break basically. Um, yeah, so that's something we have, I've bumped into um, quite some time. It took a while to discover that this was the issue, but um, yeah, you will you will see that when you enable that feature. And that is me through the questions. So we will pop to the finish. Um, please do submit your session feedback. Again, use the little uh, linky thing if you want or uh, the URL shown above. Um, and I would like to leave you with a thank you for your early morning attention and maybe spent, uh, we've got 10 minutes left for maybe some questions or um, other discussions. And then I'll leave this slide up if you are not a member yet of GSE but want to become one. And that's our demo question. I'll leave it at this and take it to you, Jamie. Thank you very much, Henry. And I have to confess, I have never, ever played Jeopardy in my entire life. And I didn't realize the rules of the game top to bottom. So I'm sorry. I'm so ashamed to admit it. Mate. No, Call okay. me from a dinosaur of a generation. <laughs> oh, dear. Um, but uh, thank you for that. That is an uh, excellent session. And uh, so, yeah, over to the audience. Any questions? You can unmute your line if you like or um, post questions in the chat. And Pete's put a question in already, Henry, for you. Yes, there was also a problem with password first character. I was not aware of that. I do read that it's been fixed. So, so was that also some special characters then, Pete, maybe? Or because I never... I never ran oh. into that one. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, definitely. Ah, OK. So uh, the question mark was meant to be the character. So if you put question mark as the first character, it would immediately oh. give you help. <laughs> oh, yeah, of course. Oh, but that's that's fixed now as well. That's that's fixed if you've got the uh, patches on, yeah. Cool, cool, cool. Oh, thank you. I will, um, I will add that to the answer of the question. <laughs> thank you. Any other questions or? I have to say, Henry, what you were saying about open source, it's just, it, they're lovely words these days. And it's nice to hear it with, like, with the mainframe as well, isn't it? Like, you know, open source RACF panels. It's just you know, fantastic. I know there's the little yeah. things in life that please me, but. <laughs> but, but again, it's the, it's the, the open source that makes it resonate with more people absolutely but, um, i mean you know yawns before github and git were uh, were a thing cbt tape was already running right and that i mean that is the cbt tape is basically the github for the mainframe uh, stuff mm -hmm. and that's so um yeah check that out it's um and not maybe just for security related things but there's so much cool stuff there that people share um it's a treasure of, of cool things. Yeah. So I'm happy to have, to have, you know, mentioned that to you guys again. Um, just a question I've got on the ACE check. When, I'm trying to remember now, was that introduced in ZOS 2.4, was it? Or trying to remember, it's quite recent, isn't it? Yeah, I think it's pre 2.4 to be oh, honest. Oh, is it? Okay. Yeah. I'm inclined to think 2.1, but I'm, I'm not very good with the, the versions and the, you know what happened when but I'm, I'm definitely sure you can find when that was introduced um, but if you're current in your in your levels then you definitely have the option to to use it um, my strong advice is start configuring that in your RACF environment absolutely but, but then be ready for the potential 
holy, right? That you might be seeing things you never knew you were seeing. And that then is a good thing in the long run. Indeed. Uh, okay, final opportunity, folks. Any questions for Henry before we uh, wrap up? I guess no. No. So once That's again, good. Henry, thank you very much. Excellent uh, session, and thank you uh, much. I love the, like I said, the the whole the Jeopardy thing. I'm uh, I'm 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 sold on it. So I might steal that idea for a future presentation. <laughs> That's okay. I, I wish you a lot of strength making the links back and forth work because that was the biggest work <laughs> on this slide deck. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. I I at least enjoyed it. I hope um, the attendees did as well. And if not, I'll gladly read it in the in the feedback. Okay. Yes. And on that note, folks, do give feedback to Henry. The session one A A. Um, please do that. Uh, it's also important for those of you that are collecting CP points because that is used to calculate the uh, the number of CP hours that you can claim. So when you go to my GSE at the end of this conference, uh, there's an option there to generate your CP certificate and then your hours will be reflected on there. As I said, providing that you've given all the, the, the feedback for all of the sessions that you actually have uh, you know uh, attended. Um, so yep, thanks Henry for that. Um, okay. So we are going to take a break now um, until 10.30. So to, throughout today's security stream is running pretty much uh, a session. In fact, it is a session um, in all the uh, available slots. So we're back at 10.30. Um, and the session will be around SDSF security and uh, how it works from ZOS 2.5. Or sorry for our American friends on the line, ZOS 2.5. 2.5 and that's going to be uh, 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 Rob Scott from Rocket Software is going to take us through that so I hope you can join us um, and just a quick heads up for later in the week so um, why Choi is returning to GSE to give uh, a second session around uh, certificates remember for the she was with us last year at the conference um to do her first session uh, around how you resolve issues around certificates and this is like a follow-on session so what she asked me um to uh, to, to to sort of pre-announce as it were is that if you can listen to that recording from last year i've put the link in her synopsis for her session on thursday so you can listen to the replay for that so if you've not if you've not joined that do listen last year do listen to it because you might get a bit lost in her second session and remember she did say last year she was going to do a follow-up session so it'd be really good if you could listen to that as a prereq if you didn't get the opportunity to do it um but yeah that's it folks for this uh, for this session like i said thanks once again henry for all the efforts in uh, putting that, uh, that that session together really really enjoyed it and, uh, cool. and, and I'm sure the rest of the audience did too. And thanks, uh, and thank you viewers for your participation as well. And we'll uh, see you at 10.30 um, in the security track if you're gonna join us there. If not, there's plenty of other sessions that you can join, lots of other streams running. So do take the opportunity to look at those. And uh, that's it folks, see you, uh, see you later in the day. Thanks, Henry. Thank you very much, bye-bye.